Thank you. So my name is Guillaume. I work at EPFL on uh, .E as a compiler engineer. And today I'm trying, going to give a talk on for some of the interesting things we do with types in .E. So I'm going to start by talking about type parameter inference and how it's different in .E. And then, depending on the remaining time, I might do some uh, simple light coding to show off some cool stuff. And so the main thing that I want you to take from this talk is that hacking compiler is fun, and you should do it. And so the, that might not be something that m many people knew recently, but then I guess Miles got bored of finding bugs in Scala C, and he decided to fix all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and people really, really liked that. So I think that, that makes my point, like that compiler hacking is fun and profitable. So I, I hope to give you a taste of what compiler hacking is like. So type parameter in France, what, what is it? Uh, 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 when you have like a type a definition like this uh, foo, which takes the type parameter t and then takes an argument of type t and returns an argument of type p, and then you want to type foo of one, so you want to infer the type parameter uh, t in this call to foo. How does that work? So uh, to understand that, we need to understand a bit about how typing works. So typing is done from left to right. And when you type a type application, uh, you first have to create type variables for each missing type argument. Then uh, there will be a bunch of subtyping checks that will be done during the course of the type checking that will constrain this type variable. And finally, we will replace this type variable by a solution to these constraints if they exist that uh, type checks. So uh, let's continue with our example of foo. Uh, the first thing we do is create a type variable uh, t question mark. I'm just going to call it t uh, for foo. Uh, that uh, because the, the type parameter of foo in this call is inferred, then uh, we type uh, foo t of one, and doing this type checking adds a constraint on t. It must be a super type of int. So this means t is a super type of int the arrow thing here. And finally, we instantiate t to int uh, because it respects the constraints and it allows our program to type check. Uh, so I'm not going to explain how uh, all these constraints work, how we avoid cycles, and how subtyping and constraint uh, checking interact because all that stuff works and it isn't, it's, it's interesting, but uh, it's not the part that we are interested in today. Today I want to talk about the art of instantiation. Uh, when, when do you instantiate a type variable? And the, this might not seem like an, an important thing, but it is. So the way it works in that is that we instantiate type variables as late as possible. Otherwise, we might miss further constraints on these type variables and our program might not type check. But we cannot, type, we cannot delay instantiating type variables forever. Otherwise, we, we cannot type our program. And the second question is that uh, in most interesting cases, the lower bound and upper bound of your type variables are different. So you need to pick one to instantiate your type variable. And the, the one to pick depends on where the type variable appears in your resulting type. So let's start with the easy stuff. So when we have, um, in some cases, instantiation is safe. And by safe, I mean that we can pick one solution and be sure that it's not going to prevent us from uh, type checking the rest of our program because we picked the wrong solution. So suppose that we have a method foo with a type parameter t and some arguments, we don't care about these arguments, and then some return type, which might be complicated. And suppose that we have a call to this method foo, and uh, after this call, we use the result of this call to call some other method or do some other processing on our type. Then uh, the question is, 
can we instantiate T right after typing foo uh, with its arguments and before typing bar? And the answer is it depends. It depends on where T appears in the return type. So if T appears nowhere in the return type, so if, uh, for example, the return type was int, then it does not matter. You can pick any constraint you want, and it's not going to affect the rest of, of the type checking of your program because uh, your call to bar does not depend on t in any way. So uh, instantiation is safe, and you can pick uh, low or high, so we pick low arbitrarily. Now, if t appears covariantly, so for example, if the return type was list of t, then instantiation is also safe, and we should pick the lower bound. So it's, that means that, for example, if t was bounded by nothing and int, we should pick nothing and get list of nothing. And this works because uh, of a property of typing system called narrowing, which means that if you have uh, some expression that type checks, and you have a term in that expression that has a type, and you know a more precise type for that, for that term, you can replace the type of that, ex of that term by this more precise type. So for example, you can replace list of int by list of nothing, if that's the type of your term, and it's not going to affect type checking. And narrowing holds most of the time, and you know, when we are doing our safe instantiation, it holds, so we're fine. Uh, the contravariant case is the mirror case of the covariant case. Uh, instantiation is also safe, but you should pick the higher bound to get the most precise type. And the interesting cases happen when t appears both co and contravariantly. For example, uh, if our return type was a tuple which takes a list of t and a sink of t, or some other type with a contravariant type parameter, or if t appears contravariantly, uh, invariantly. In that case, instantiation is not safe. That means that we can pick low or high, but uh, that might mean that the rest of our program does not type check because uh, we picked the wrong one or the correct one was some other type between low and high. <laughs> and so well, why, why does all this matter anyway? So in Scala C, uh, instantiation is done mostly eagerly. I'm not going to go into too much details because I don't actually know for the details of the Scala C algorithm. Um, but basically, it's going to instantiate type parameters as soon as it can. And the, that's not such a big issue in Scala C because it has this fear of nothing, uh, which means that uh, it will never infer nothing. So for example, when we have this class foo, which takes a type parameter t, when we try to type check new foo, it's going to infer nothing, and then because Classy dislikes nothing, it's going to reject that and wait uh, for the t to be further constrained. So we are going to have our curl to put, and this can only type checks if t is equal to string, so that's what Scalacy picks. So uh, that seems like an okay solution, except that it completely fails as soon as your lower bound is not nothing. So if you just simply replace t by t is a super type of null, then you get a type mismatch because when you type new foo, Scala C is completely happy to set t equals to null and then fail to type the call to put. And the other very annoying thing with that is that sometimes you really want to infer nothing, but you can't because if you try to infer nothing, well, Scala C just gives up and gives you an error message. So all these examples work in dot heap and without any special case handling because we just delay uh, in inferring type, param type variables until we really need to do that. Here's another interesting consequences of uh, instantiation order. So if you have a um, method with a type parameter t, like same and two parameter lists, uh, in Scala C, uh, the parameter list will be inferred one after the other, and it will infer t just after having type checked the first parameter list, which means that when you type same new a new b, it's going to infer t is equal to a, and then fail 
uh, to because B is not a subtype of A. And this is something that people actually use <laughs> because it means that you can uh, enforce type equality. And please don't do that. <laughs> please, please just, just use the equality uh, constraint instead. Just use an implicit parameter to, and two type parameters. And, and that works and does not rely on the order of instantiation of type variables. Yes? Um, so uh, I, I do use this trick, um, though. Please stop. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But more often, more often than not, I use it to um, sort of force Scala-C to um, fix type T in the second block, so that it can do some sort of uh, lookup, usually implicit, um, without having to worry about solving that parameter. It should not have to do that, and. The, I'm going to talk about implicit and all the funny stuff afterwards. And so the point is that we instantiate uh, type parameters as as late as we can, but not too late. And Scala C instantiate them as eagerly as it can, uh, but sometimes it's too late anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see examples later. Uh, so. Well, yeah. When do we actually need to instantiate these type parameters? Um, so sometimes we need a free defined type. A free defined type is a type which does not contain any uninstantiated type variable. Uh, the main case is when you're trying to assign a type to a definition like a val or a def, because Scala does not have global type inference. So the stuff that's written after your definition cannot affect its type. So you need to fully infer uh, the type. The other ca interesting case is when you're trying to type a lambda expression. I'll get to that in a moment. And then when you're trying to perform an implicit search. So lambdas. Uh, when you have some method foo that takes a lambda, for a, a function from int to int, and then you write an expression like foo that takes an x that goes to x plus 1. This is the sugar to this thing here. And like, that doesn't really matter. The part that matters is that in the desugaring, we created a method called dollar uh, that takes an int and returns an int and contains the body of the lambda. And what this means is that to type a lambda, we need to know the types of uh, its parameter and its return type, because we cannot create a def without knowing its types. So to desugar lambda, we need the parameter types and return types. So we need to fully define the type of the lambda. And as a special case, we also avoid inferring nothing for the parameter types of lambdas, because what, what are you going to do with a parameter that has type nothing? Right? Um, and now we're getting to the funny part where we're instantiating as late as possible, but we're still instantiating earlier than Scala C. Because, so we have like this method which takes an app, uh, uh, this, this method called app which takes a type parameter t and takes uh, an argument and a function and applies the argument to the function. And in Scala C, you have to um, ascribe the the parameter of the lambda. Uh, but in .t, you don't, because to type the lambda, we need to fully define uh, the type of its uh, formal type, which is t to t. To do that, we need to instantiate t, which has been uh, constrained to be a super type of int. So we just choose t equals int, and we are done. And we don't need to annotate the lambda parameter to get um, to get type inference to work correctly. So the way people work around that in Scala C is that they use two parameter lists exactly so that T is inferred before we look at T underscore T. But uh, in Scala C, uh, inference has to wait until it has run through the whole parameter list to infer type parameters, and that's too late. Yes? Sorry. Um, so you don't infer nothing for the, the lambda parameters. Yeah. What happens if you um, map on nil with uh, an identity lambda, x or ox? 
uh, I'd have to look at the definition of map to be sure. Doesn't it take? Uh, uh, so, so, okay, so forget can build from. Like map on real nil with like x zero x. So like it takes a lambda, mm -hmm. um, of, and the input type a is instantiated to the type of the uh, uh, the the parameter type of the list, which in this case is nothing because it's nil. So the correct inference is nothing. Mm -hmm. And because I'm doing x arrow x, like it, it, that nothing but actually has to propagate through. But even without, uh, without that, you want your map to be polymorphic in its return type, right? If you map some function to a list of something, you might want to get a list of something else as a return type. So map has like this. I think map takes a b as a parameter type, which is a super type of uh, the a of the list. Yeah, okay. and so stuff. There is a funny detail here. The type which is actually getting to be instantiated is not the type that you see in signature. It's a prototype type that's going to be used to type lambda. I don't know what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so in short, what happens is you're, you're not going to instantiate the type argument yet. You're going to instantiate something that you're going to use to type the lambda. And if you are going to instantiate with nothing, you're not introducing any information that will help to type it. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I get, get you killed by that. So, almost done. Uh, the last interesting case is implicit search. So, implicit search needs, well, in .e we. The way it works is that we need to have three defined types before doing uh, an implicit search. And if you don't, uh, you get weird stuff like ambiguous implicits because you have to look into the lower and upper bounds of your type parameters, and you, you get too many implicits. And I think it would also be too slow and not very useful or very uh, user friendly. So we just uh, do that. But then, then we run into issues because narrowing does not hold. Remember when I said that you can replace uh, some type, if you know a more precise type for a value, you can use that? Well, no, you can't uh, for implicit. Uh, so the example I have here is you have some class uh, which takes a contravariant type parameter, and you're trying to get its class tag. Uh, so you're taking a contra of t, and you want a class tag of t, which means that uh, if I pass contra of int, I really want to get class tag of int. But uh, t is inferred to be between nothing and int. And uh, based on the algorithm we saw earlier, where we try to pick uh, the most specific types, uh, if we don't know what type to pick, we're going to pick uh, the, 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 up, the lower bound, which means we're going to pick nothing, which is not what we want here. So this means that, well, the, the intuition here is that uh, if, if I explicitly, as a user, constrain one bound of a type and only that bound, then uh, it's probably the one that I want you to use uh, to infer other stuff. So uh, this is why we have this special rules where when we're trying to fully define a type uh, and we look at the type variables defined in that type, if only the lower bound of a type variable is constrained, then we instantiate to that. If only the upper bound is constrained, then we instantiate to that. And then there's another special case for implicit where uh, if the first two cases are not true, uh, we always use the lower bound just because it works better. Uh, I think it makes more sense too based on what people do for implicit values with contravariant parameters. And Finally, if that's not the case, then we just use the same rules as for same instantiation where we use we look at the type and look at where the T appears in the type if it appears only covariantly or not. And uh, that's it for type parameter in France. And if you're curious, you can look at the code. It's like 300 lines of code compared to, I don't know how many thousands of lines in France does is in, in Scala C, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> please, please have a look at that. Um, I still have time, so I think I'm gonna switch to some improvised live demo thing.
So Dottie has a REPL since recently, and it even has colors in this REPL now because we stole the cool stuff from Ammonite. So you can do something like. But we don't have colors in the return anyway. So uh, Dotty has a few uh, cool features in types that I haven't talked about, like union types. So you can do, oh, let me do it. I, I hope it does not crash. I have almost never used that REPL. I saw I'm typing without looking at my screen, so. So, <laughs> Dottie has unboxed union types without crazy uh, and type encoding things. I think that's like one of the first things I saw uh, when I learned Scala was mice post on, on some crazy encoding of, of union types. <laughs> and, and somehow I'm still doing Scala stuff. And <laughs> uh, anyway, so. Union types were created to solve the mostly uh, theoretical issues where the sometimes you want the upper bounds of two types, like if you have an if else, and sometimes that upper bound does not exist or well it exists but it's infinite, and and then you get funny types. So uh, it's much easier to just say well it exists and we just define it to be of a union of the two types, but that means that you can do some cool stuff with it like. Uh, be able to call a method on the union, even if that method is not defined on the super type. And the way it works internally is that it's going to do uh, just instance of checks to decide which of the two methods to call. So it's not slow. It's, an, it's not like reflection. Yes? Uh, can you change the return type to both definitions? So <laughs> That's quite loud. <laughs> can, can you return the, uh, can, you, can you change the definitions of F to singleton types? Uh, <laughs> I think so. So I, I, I wanted to talk about singleton types okay, later, okay. but I won't if, you, if you're excited about singleton types, we can go to singleton types. <laughs> uh, so I, I think we're all excited about singleton yeah. types. Yeah. So Dottie has SIP 23 like literal based singleton types. Uh, so if, for example, uh, one has type one, not one dot type, because that's too much typing, obviously. <laughs> and and that does not type check. OK. I have no idea why the class did not type check. Sorry? OK, no, it just check. OK. Anyway, let's see. Do, do, do something other than one. OK. OK, what's the union of one and two? It's int. Oh yeah. <laughs> so if I do yes, is that what you expected? Can you, um, can you get it to infer? Is, is there any chance you can get it to infer uh, one or two as the type? So we do not infer any union types by default. And by that I mean you cannot you can infer something like list A or B, but we never infer A or B uh, because it breaks everything when you, you when you ref infer union types. But we have a language import to keep the union types instead of widening them. And I don't even remember. I don't even know if it works in the wrapper or. Oh, let's see. Uh, mm. Okay, uh, okay, maybe I can do that. Okay, no. Uh, <laughs> it's probably a uh, repel that uh, screws things up, but we have a language import to keep unions, and uh, 
I don't know if that actually makes very much sense to have be able to somehow change the type, typing rules in the middle of your program. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's mostly useful for, for checking stuff. Um, so where was I? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the combination of union types and singleton types is interesting because you can do, well, something like that. And, and that works perfectly fine. Uh, but then uh, maybe you want to do something like that. And that actually works, but it doesn't do what you think it does because when you have a union of singleton types, we end up widening them because we lose the information at some point in the type check-in. And I've been looking at trying to fix that, but uh, it's, not, it's not trivial because uh, in the default case, like in 99% of cases, you don't want to keep this singleton types because if you kept them, then subtyping would become probably very slow because every time you have some big uh, expression with lots of conditions, you'd end up with a type which is like one or two or twin or A or X or string or whatever, and you don't want that. So we should be able to only infer these types if the expected type, the type that the user has written on the left-hand side, is a union. But uh, I'm not sure yet. So that, that's one interesting thing when you do compiler development is interaction between features and what makes sense and what does not make sense and what blows up the compiler. Uh, and we have, I have like 30 seconds. I think I can show uh, name type parameters. So if I have something like uh, some method which takes two type parameter uh, and I want to explicitly pass one and infer the other. Wow. That works. And I, you, you should clap for Martin. I did not implement that. <laughs> and the other cool thing and is that you can do that for class types too, but you have to do it explicitly. So the, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that when you start having name type parameters, is that type parameters become part of your API. If you change your type parameter, then something that depends on it has to be changed. So if you just write this, uh, then uh, you can do new foo d equals and that doesn't compile. But I'm going to use a new name to avoid blowing up the repo. If you write this, then you can do new bar t equals int, and that works. And so besides the obvious applications to uh, improve the inference where you infer only part of your parameters, uh, this is useful for uh, doing something kind of like higher kind of types, but less, not really higher kind of types, because you can take um, some, uh, some type, like if you have a type parameter m, you can type some m, uh, equals uh, yeah you can do something like that can you no uh, oh no yeah so the syntax is if m okay I forgot the syntax but this needs to take an argument are you sure? Oh, yeah, like that. Are you sure? No. Okay, I forgot the syntax. Type again. Wait, whatever. But anyway, the point is that uh, you can have a method which takes uh, some uh, type parameter which has a name type argument, and that means that uh, you can, if you know the name of it type argument, you can uh, change change it to something else and do the sort of things you do with higher order, uh, higher kind of type parameters 
where you apply them to different arguments and get different result types. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>